With the passing of the first deputy of Al Imam al Mahdi, who was going to carry out the important task? Who was going to bear the responsibility on their shoulders to be the representative of the 12th Imam? Let's find out. In the previous video, we learned about the first deputy of Al Imam al Mahdi, Ajalallahu Ta'ala Faraj al Sharif, Uthman ibn Sa'id al Hamri, who served the Imam from the 260th year till approximately 267. And we know that the first deputy of the Imam had agents throughout the Muslim world in different cities, people who followed his instructions as he received them from the 12th Imam. One of those agents was his own very son, Muhammad ibn Uthman, who had been in the care of the 11th Imam and even about whom the 11th Imam had said that Al-Amri wa ibnuhu thiqatan, the man who is going to be the first deputy of the 12th Imam, Uthman ibn Sa'id, and his son are both trusted representatives. This is what the 11th Imam said about not only Uthman ibn Sa'id, but his son, Muhammad ibn Uthman. So we know that already there was a infrastructure that was being developed, particularly in those years of the minor occultation of the 12th Imam. And we know that the first deputy, after moving from Samarra to Baghdad, had set up a neighborhood of sorts. And it is reported that this became almost like a stronghold of where the Shia, the supporters of the Ahl al-Bayt, the followers of the Imams, would actually live together and interact with each other and have a place where they could come together to plan and to coordinate their activities and fulfill the directives of the 12th Imam. And so imagine the upbringing, the education, the training of the second deputy, Muhammad ibn Uthman, how it must have taken place. And we know that upon the demise of Uthman ibn Sa'id al-Amri, that he appointed based on the instructions of al-Imam al-Mahdi, his son, to the second deputyship. He took over in the 267th year. And Muhammad ibn Uthman, it is related, was devoted, trustworthy, and a loyal companion of the Imams and a trusted follower, somebody who could be relied upon. Hence his being appointed to that position, to that office. We also know that the second deputy of the Imam was a contemporary of four of the Abbasid Khalifs. And that for the 40 years that he was in this appointment, the longest of any of the four deputies, that he faced great challenges just like his father and indeed like those who were going to come after him. And in having to fulfill that responsibility, he not only had to take upon himself to go and interact with the Shia, bring back their questions to the Imam, fulfill the tasks that his father had begun of answering religious questions, uh, collecting the religious dues, providing theological answers to people, keeping the Shia unified, and also making sure that there were no myths or superstitions or false claims to the Imam. But in addition to that, he had others who would work with him, agents who would support him in the various cities. Thus, with the passing of the first deputy of Al-Imam al-Mahdi, for whom Al-Imam al-Mahdi even, it is reported, gave condolences to the son and congratulated him on the martyrdom, on the passing from this world of his father, a great man who would be blessed in the next world, we know that Muhammad ibn Uthman had to carry the burden of this office and do so in a way where he continued the legacy of his father. It is reported that like his father, the second deputy had a trade. He was a merchant. And in some cases, it is reported that very specifically he sold vinegar and did so in the markets as a means by which he could also carry out his activities for the 12th Imam. The first deputy was actually an oil seller. And as the historical reports say, he would in fact hide the khums money that he had received from the Shia for the Imam in the barrels of oil when he would go for trade in the caravans. In a similar manner, the second deputy was a seller of vinegar or a producer of vinegar and a trader of vinegar. So we can see that the deputies had normal jobs, had vocations, and that they would use these vocations to ingrain themselves into society, to be participants in the machinery of society and the trade of society, and simultaneously carry out the directives of the 12th Imam. Muhammad ibn Uthman continued where his father left off, not only with the basic duties of the deputies, but he also was a man of knowledge, a man of piety. It is reported that he wrote books on jurisprudence and received a stamp of approval from the Imam himself about the veracity 
and the truth and the correctness, the authenticity of anything that he had written. He also wrote books on various other topics and used those books to help answer the questions of the Shia, obviously again with the permission of the Imam. It is also reported that the second deputy, Muhammad ibn Uthman, was the one who transmitted not only Dua al-Simat, but also Dua al-Iftitah. In addition to these fiqhi or jurisprudential activities, transmission of the Dua, it is reported in the history that the second deputy also continued receiving the Tawqiyya or the signature, the authentic emblem from the 12th Imam. In fact, he answered many important questions, one of which was about fuqah or the fermented barley water for which there are even rulings today from our jurists. He also reported about khums and the answers that the 12th Imam gave to people about khums and that those who do not pay their khums when it has become due upon them is as if they are swallowing fire in their bellies. He also answered questions that related to people's personal affairs. So for example, it is even reported in the historical events that once a married couple had sent a query to the Imam to solve their problems. And through Muhammad ibn Uthman, they received their answers. And indeed, through the prayers and the guidance of the 12th Imam, their problems were solved. Thus you see, from this beautiful personality, this remarkable individual like his father, Muhammad ibn Uthman, was someone who was continuing the process of developing infrastructure. Today, this is a lesson for us that as we develop ourselves personally, interpersonally, our organizations, our centers, our mosques, we must focus on infrastructure, developing a foundation that is built on the very tenets of faith and sound practice of religion, and do so in a manner that is adherent to the very code of Islam, and that is to engage everybody. And you will see from not only the examples of Muhammad ibn Uthman, his predecessor, his father, but also his successors, the ones who came after him to act as the deputies of Al-Imam al-Mahdi, that the engagement of those agents who were helping, who were supporting, and who were carrying out the activities placed upon them was a means by which the actual imamat had become ingrained in the average individual, and that no individual could feel that they were disconnected from the imam in any way. And that is how we have to develop ourselves today. That if we want to feel empowerment, if we want to feel that we are a part of this very movement, this very thing that we call our faith and our religion, then we must become a part of that infrastructure. And the infrastructure of our organizations and who we are must support us to become a part of it, such that each person contributes to the advancement of the cause. In the 40 years of deputyship, of Muhammad ibn Uthman al-Amr. He witnessed very difficult events, some of which had ramifications in the life of the third deputy. For instance, he experienced and witnessed the Zanj rebellion. This was a rebellion of slaves against the Abbasid regime, and it was carried out at the head, at the leadership of a man who claimed to be the descendant of Zayd ibn Ali ibn al-Husayn Zayn al-Abideen alayhim as -salam. So it was a purported relative or a family member of the Prophet of the Ahl al-Bayt who had revolted and against the Abbasid regime had now taken up arms. Thus these events were occurring. In addition, the second deputy witnessed the rise of the Karamatians. The Karamatians were a splinter group from the Shiites and in those days they had taken up activities in various parts of the Arabian Peninsula and had founded to some degree a headquarters from which they would then attack the Abbasid regime at various locations. And we know that because of this disruption, because they were viewed to be a Shia group, that the Abbasid regime would then persecute further the people who were living under their rule and create more pressure upon the Imams and indeed the representatives and the agents of the Imams. The spies were already all over the Islamic nation watching anyone who may support the Imams or send their religious dues to the Imams. Hence, you can see that the role and the task that was placed upon Muhammad ibn Uthman was very difficult and very challenging. The second deputy of Al-Imam al-Mahdi, after serving for 40 years and compiling so much material, so much knowledge, all the books, all the answers, all the tawqiyah of Al-Imam al-Mahdi, 
that were helping the people began to plan for the next step. And knowing that he was going to leave this world, he had already appointed the next deputy based on the instructions of the 12th Imam and handed to him not only the jurisprudential material that he had compiled over those many decades, but also all of the answers, all of the network connections and access to the agents. The third deputy was already somebody who was actively participating in the tasks that had been placed upon Muhammad ibn Uthman. And we will see in the next video how he continued the legacy of the deputyship of Imam al-Mahdi and dealt with different circumstances. It is related that the second deputy of Imam al-Mahdi left this world in the 307th year after Hijrah approximately, after serving again for 40 years as the deputy of the 12th Imam. It is related that he is buried near his mother in Baghdad in a place known as Al-Khallani. And people again come to visit him and commemorate his life and his achievements and what he was able to do in the cause of Imam to protect this very divine appointed office that serves us even today. With that, I wish you well. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.